Greetings again. My name is Chuck Anderson. I'm the editor of Discovery News. Uh, we print a newspaper. It comes out from time to time as we have new things to report. It's called Discovery News, and we make that available. We'll give you our email address at the end of this presentation. We've also produced a number of videos, which we post up on YouTube, and you can find that at um, Discovery News, Chuck Anderson. And uh, we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. We started a, a series of Bible studies about the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Our purpose in this study is to try to help unravel some of the confusion that exists about this marvelous book of Bible prophecy, end time events, and of course, it's also a book that reveals the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's a lot of confusion in the world, and, and we'd like to try to address some of that. So our first uh, couple of series had to do with unraveling some of those mysteries. And in particular, our last session, we dealt with unraveling the sequence of events. It's very helpful to know uh, the sequence of things that are happening. But today, we'd like to move into chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation. Uh, the Lord sent special letters, seven letters, that were given to the Apostle John as he was a prisoner on the Isle of Patmos. And uh, by the way, those letters to those seven churches in Asia Minor are also personal letters addressed to us today. So we are wise to take heed and listen to what the Lord says. Those seven churches, as I mentioned, were in Asia Minor, which is um, pretty much uh, modern-day Turkey today. And if you were to start at Ephesus, which was the seaport, uh, there's a Roman road that went right through uh, from Ephesus to Smyrna to Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. It's kind of the mail route. This is the trade route where, where so many travelers would go. And it's interesting that the letters are addressed in that same order. So if you were to take a walk, quite a, lo quite a long walk, from Ephesus over to Laodicea, you'd go through those seven towns. And those are the seven letters uh, that, the, uh, that the Lord penned, actually gave through the Apostle John. Today, I want to deal with the first two, Ephesus and Smyrna. And both towns, by the way, were very wealthy communities. They, they were seaports, and so products from all over the Roman world would come through, through their streets, through their seaports. And um, busy trade routes, caravans, visitors coming from all over the world. And Ephesus, in particular, was very wealthy. And they took advantage of the caravans and the many visitors that would spend a night or two. And, uh, and so they developed businesses to address all their visitors and the money they, they, that they brought. They built a large heathen temple to Diana. Uh, and part of their wealth came from craftsmen who made little idols that they would sell to, uh, to their visitors. I suppose they were exorbitant prices because uh, the people were very wealthy. But Ephesus was a beautiful city, Roman, uh, of course, and uh, it consisted of that huge temple to Artemis or Diana and uh, many other religious temples that were there, a big coliseum where the people could meet, and, of course, it was a seaport. You might wonder what a group of Christian people, kind of a house church, if you will, when it first started, just a small handful of, of believers. When the Apostle Paul went there, you wonder what kind of impact could these people make on a big city with the Temple of Diana there and so forth. Uh, just a little old church and just a few people were speaking the message of the gospel. But we read some fascinating things about 
about their message and, uh, and the impact that it made on Ephesus uh, back in the book of Acts chapter 16. And we'd like to read some of these verses, starting with verses 8 to 10. And Paul went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. And when some were hardened and believed not, but spoke evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And verse 10, and this continued for the space of two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And the name of the Lord, in verse 17, was magnified. And then we read in verse 18, And many that believed uh, came and confessed and showed their deeds. And many of those who used magical arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And listen to this. They counted the price of those books that they burned and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. There was a revival going on in the city of Ephesus, believe you me. And so mightily grew the word of God and, and prevailed. And then we read in verses 23 to 41 about an uproar. The silversmiths, of course, were losing business. People were turning in faith to Christ and throwing away their idols and burning their books and uh, their magical arts and all that. And so there was an uproar. And the whole city gathered in this huge coliseum, and it was, a, it was a real riot that took place. And, uh, you know, that, that's just the impact of a few Christian people in a very heathen and a very idolatrous and also a very perverse community. Well, it was this group of faithful believers that Jesus sent his first of seven letters to through the Apostle John. And the year was probably somewhere between the year 90 and 95. Uh, Paul had also sent them a letter 30 years previous to this, the book of Ephesians. And so now there, there were many mature believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Isle of Patmos, where John was incarcerated was not a very happy place. Pretty bleak. And of course, all the people that were on the island were, were prisoners of Rome, some lawbreakers, some political prisoners, I'm sure. But it was on that island where the Lord appeared to John and, and gave him these seven letters. Uh, Patmos was uh, out of the Aegean or the Mediterranean Sea, some 63 miles from Ephesus. And here's what we read in, in chapter 2 in, in verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now the Lord Jesus, in addressing the church of Ephesus, uh, let them know, I am there with you. Uh, the seven stars or the seven messengers to the uh, seven pastors, if you will, to the seven churches. He holds them in his hand. But he walks amongst the seven golden lampstands, which speaks of the fact that Jesus walks amongst the people of the church. And uh, he observes everything they do. He knows all that's going on. And, of course, he's there to bless them. In verses 2 and 3, I know your works your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say that they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. These Christians were, were true to the word. Uh, they were laboring. You'll find that word used several times, uh, the fact that they were laboring, they had patience, and they couldn't put up with, with uh, evil thoughts and, and liars and false doctrine. And they were a faithful group of people. And, and the Lord said in verse 3, 
You have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. By the way, working for the Lord Jesus Christ can often be very exhausting. And these believers in Ephesus labored. And, um, you know, I suppose part of the labor was feeding the poor and, and helping one another and encouraging one another and so forth. And a lot of things involved in, in the work of, of the Lord. But they labored for the Lord's namesake. And then the Lord also complimented them by saying, there's one thing you have, and that is you hate the, the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Deeds of the Nicolaitans. By the way, the, the Christians in Ephesus, they despise the things that the Lord despises. And one of the things God hates is the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Nikeo means to conquer, and laity, of course, the people. Uh, the Lord uh, dislikes, he despises the conquering of the people. And sometimes that even takes place within our churches. It shouldn't. Uh, the domineering of, you know, the hierarchy over the laity. God despises that. And we read in 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, verses 2 to 6, God says, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight of it, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy money or lucre, but of a ready mind. And then he says, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Uh, he wanted leaders especially to be aware, I don't want you to lord it over the people. Uh, you need to teach them and be examples, but uh, not conquering them, the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And then when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. That was his promise to being faithful to the Lord. Verse 5, in a like manner, uh, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yes, all of you be subject one to another. And be clothed through humility, for God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Uh, there's a point where Christians need to be in subjection to the word of God, and we need to submit to one another. And uh, God dis despises that thing called the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Verse 6, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Humble yourself. And then in verse 3, you have persevered, back in Revelation chapter 2, you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. But then in the very next verse, uh, the Lord points out something that, that broke his heart and concerned him. Uh, this concern or criticism found in verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. Left your first love. What do you mean by that? They were serving the Lord. They were faithful in their labors and their work for, for the Lord. But in the, in the process of all their activity, they seem to have cooled off in their affection, their relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord pointed that out. He said, I'm concerned you've left your first love. It's, it's kind of like uh, leaving honeymoon marriage, uh, intimacy. And now we're just, oh, we live together and we're busy. And, uh, you know, that can happen in human relationships. And it can certainly happen in relationships between us and the Lord Jesus. There's a great danger of uh, serving out of duty. A dedication instead of devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. Kind of me mechanical orthodoxy. And uh, we need to learn that good works and ministries are no replacement for a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the Lord, above all, wants us to be in a, a relationship, a fellowship with him daily. Not just doing good works. So what does God think about church? 
Well, in the case of the church of Ephesus, they were doing the right thing, but perhaps of the wrong motive. Their love for Jesus had, had cooled off. The correction found in, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 5, remember from where you are fallen. Uh, remember how it was when, when you first trusted me, says the Lord. I want you to remember. And then he gives a command in, in verse 5, repent and do the first works or else I will come unto you quickly and I will remove your lampstand out of its place except you repent. What do believers have to repent of in today's world? Uh, you know, a church goes on as normal and so forth, but you know, we're living in a day that later we'll read about, the church of Laodicea, which means very lukewarm. Not hot, not cold, kind of lost its message. Uh, what do believers have to repent of today? What do I have to repent of? And uh, how is it that Perhaps I have left my, my first love. You know, we, we live in a world that just seems to be blowing apart. We're all aware of what's going on. And you have to ask the question, why? What's happening in our world and why? Is the biggest problem with the unbelievers, the politicians, the perverts, the sinners that are out there outside the church? Or is it possible that, that Christians are partly to blame for this? Uh, have we left our first love? Have we lost our, our passion for the gospel and reaching the lost? Why no revival? Well, you know, Matthew chapter 5, and we read in verses 13 to 16, you are the salt of the earth, uh, the preservative of the earth, is what the Lord is saying. And if the salt has lost its saltiness, with what shall it be salted? Uh, it is therefore good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trampled underfoot by men. Uh, that's what people would do with salt when it, when it became rancid and it was no longer effective. They just throw it out in the street. And the armies and the people of the, of the uh, cities would just walk on it. Uh, is it possible that the salt has lost its savor in, in the world in which we live is very possible. Uh, we have all these churches, especially in the United States, in every corner. And yet the country, the culture is turning to perversion and immorality and deception. It's just unreal what's, what's going on. Well, the Lord says, you're the light of the world and a city that's on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they put the light under a lampstand, or in a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all that are in the house. And then he says to us in Matthew, Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So why no revival? I made a list. <laughs> you know, it's uh, pretty convicting. When I, when I was making this list, I thought, wow. Some of this stuff is, is uh, applying to me. But I made a list. Number one, unread Bibles. It's easy to have our Bibles uh, more as a decoration piece on the coffee table and not necessarily consumed with reading it and absorbing it. But unread Bibles, unseeking hearts. We lose our desire for the things of the Lord and 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 no longer seek him like, like we should. Unfruitful lives. You know, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, etc. And many times as Christians, we're just not fruitful. We're not walking with the Spirit. Unbelieving prayer. You know, I embarrassed myself one time. I, I, uh, I went to pray, and the first thing I said is, Lord, thank you for this food. And I realized that, you know, I'm not even eating. And here I start a prayer like that. What is wrong with me? My brain's not in gear. And well, we, we can go through the motion of prayer. But sometimes we don't pray in faith believing. We use the word if, give all sorts of reasons why God is not going to answer prayer. 
I think about praying for the lost. You know, the Lord says he's not willing and he should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We ought to be praying for the lost in faith. Uh, ungodly entertainment fills our homes. Uh, about a year ago, I realized that here I am uh, watching programs on TV where there's all sorts of vulgarity and stuff, and, and my heart my mind doesn't need that. And I just thought, it's time to, to cancel this. I'm better watching old-time black-and-white westerns where there's not all sorts of immorality and, and, uh, and, and cursing and, and so forth. But we need to be aware of our entertainment, the things we listen to, uh, ungratefulness. We can uh, be very ungrateful for the things that the Lord has done for us, thinking that we deserve these things. I deserve better. We can have an ungrateful spirit, unloving attitudes toward the people around us, even toward the Lord, an unforgiving spirit. Boy, I tell you, nothing can ruin you like an unforgiving, bitter spirit. We need to be aware of that. Unresolved conflicts. Uh, the Lord says if we come to, to give our offering to the Lord and remember that somebody has ought against us, leave your gift. Go be reconciled. Unresolved conflicts. Unpaid tithes. Do you know that if the church tithed 10%, if all the Christians gave to the Lord, there, there would be such an abundance we could reach out with the gospel all over. But uh, too many times we have to pay for our entertainment and, uh, and giving to the Lord becomes secondary to us. Unconfessed sins. Ungodly spiritual leaders. Man, I, I just don't understand how that some leaders that are leading big churches on Sunday raising their arms and preaching a great sermon and they're living in immorality and perversion. We've had some of that right here in Colorado Springs. Ungodly spiritual leaders. How can that be? Unholy worship. We brought the world into, into uh, worship. Uh, songs and music that uh, is fit for a dance hall, but not fit for church. And biblical teaching, a lot of that going on. Unfaithfulness and gathering together. You know, since COVID-19, Many Christians have gotten into the habit, I'm just going to watch, I'll watch a, a preacher on TV, that's good enough, and not realizing your fellowship, your encouragement is needed for other believers. Unused spiritual gifts. By the way, if you have a spiritual gift and you're not using it, uh, you're squandering what God has given to you, and that's sin. Unused spiritual gifts. Unbroken hearts. We ought to have broken hearts over the things that break the heart of the, our Lord. An unwillingness to, uh, unwillingness to witness. Um, many Christians just, it's like they plead the Fifth Amendment, not going to tell anybody they're a Christian. Uncontrolled households, uh, families that uh, are not walking with the Lord, children that are living in disobedience and rebellion, unawareness of the times. Not paying attention to what's going on in today's world. And then unwatchfulness, not looking for the, the coming of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, John had written to the Ephesians. Remember, therefore, from where you are fallen and repent. Do the first works or else I'll come to you quickly and I'll remove your lampstand. And that's exactly what's happened in so much of Christendom today. Our churches... Um, going through the motion and not believing the power of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. There's also a word of comfort, not only to them, but to us today. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. I, uh, I'm really burdened about America, and we need to pray. I hope that you will join us 
in praying every day that God would send a revival to our, to our blessed country. Our country started out so well, not that we didn't have problems, but we've, uh, we've just jumped off the cliff into perversion, deceit, immorality, and violence. Well, Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will hear, heal their land. Join us in praying for, for America. Would you do that? Maybe set your, uh, your cell phone Set the alarm at noon or sometime that's good for you. Just to, as a reminder, let's pray for America. Well, the second letter that was in, in chapter 2 that Jesus sent through the Apostle John was to a persecuted church that was really going through the fires of persecution and they were experiencing great po poverty. That church is called Smyrna. By the way, Smyrna, is, it's interesting, is from the word myrrh. And myrrh was a very expensive, uh, uh, not an ointment, but a, it, was a, it, was a, uh, it was crushed. It was, it was something that had to be crushed to give off the aroma. It was used for burial purposes and very expensive in, in the first century. Yeah, but it makes me think of like a pine needle. You can... You can put a pine needle in your mouth, but if you crush down on it and you bite into it, the, the flavor, not so good, is really strong. Well, so it was with Smyrna. They were crushed. They were the persecuted church. They were undergoing terrible tribulation. And uh, it's to that church that he wrote this, this second letter. Uh, they were not only in tribulation, but in great poverty. Why would they experience poverty in a, in a wealthy town? Because nobody would buy their wares. Nobody would hire them. Uh, they were believers in Christ, contrary to the, uh, to the false worship of Rome, where they worshiped the emperor. And so they were outcasts. And these people, when they made a decision to receive Christ, they, they paid a price. But then the Lord says to them in verse 8, Unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things, say the first and the last, who was dead and is alive. The Lord Jesus was persecuted. He suffered. He died. And he says, but I'm alive. And uh, so he wrote a uh, a letter of comfort to these people. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, Isaiah 44, 6, and the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, and besides me there is no God. The God who died for our sins, was resurrected, now glorified, the, the God who is the author of life, the God who is alive. And then in verse 9, Jesus said to the church at Smyrna, I know your works and tribulation and poverty, uh, but you're rich. Despite all that you're going through, tribulation, poverty, but you're rich. Now, the Lord uh, had just good things to say to these people who were, who were struggling so. Makes me wonder, when I pray for America, do we need to... Do we need to pray that tough times come? We lose our electricity or the, the banks all fail? I, I don't know. But it seems like in the midst of trials and difficulties is where God does his greatest work. There are third world countries today where multitudes are coming to Christ. Not necessarily so in the United States. Well, was there criticism to the church at Smyrna? Not a word. What about correction? This is what you got to do to get right. Not a word. What about the consequence of unconfessed sin to the church of Smyrna? Not a word. He did give a command. He said, fear. Fear none of those things. What you shall suffer. Be faithful unto death. Uh, the Lord is saying, I am with you. 
I suffered, I am with you. Don't live in fear of those that can hurt the body, but they cannot touch the soul. Isaiah said this in chapter 41 and verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, yea, I will help you. I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Wonderful promise. And then, of course, we think of Joshua 1.9. Have not I commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. We need to remember the Lord is with us. Jehovah Shema, the Lord who is present, the one who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so as we go back to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Be faithful even unto death. And the Lord promised in verse 10, he said, I will give you a crown of life. Uh, the Lord who is glorified. Someday we're going to see him as he is and we will be like him. And those of us that know him will be glorified. Remarkable thing. Second Timothy 4, 8. The Apostle Paul, even as he suffered so many things, he said this. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Well, back in Revelation, as we finish up our thoughts about the church of Smyrna, he that overcomes shall not be heard of the second death. I just, uh, I, I hope that you'd pray with me a minute for our beloved country, for the United States. My, how we need a revival how we need to see people turn to the Lord. We're living in such a day of, of deception and perversion and violence. Oh Lord, we lift our hearts to you today and just pray for America. You have said in your word, you're not willing any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Lord, I don't know if it would take suffering and difficulties for multitudes to turn to you, but Lord, whatever it would take, would you bring a spirit of revival to our country? I just ask you to work in a special way that multitudes would come to know you in your grace. I also want to pray today, Lord, for the persecuted church. They're just like the church of Smyrna. Uh, there are Christians living in constant fear. Uh, they, they worship in secret. Some are being beheaded. Others are losing jobs, being terribly persecuted because of their faith in the Lord Jesus. And Lord, I just ask you to, to be with them, encourage them, and bless them, keep them. And give them courage as they face all sorts of trials. Lord, be with those dear people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, you may have questions or comments about our teaching. And uh, I've listed our email address for you, discoverynews1 at aol.com. We'll try to answer anybody that corresponds with us. We also have a website that has all sorts of information, www.discovery.global. And uh, you're welcome to look at that. But finally, uh, the videos that we are producing are being well-received. Uh, I think I mentioned last time that we put out a video uh, about Russia and the future of the world, global uh, nuclear warfare and so forth. And uh, over a quarter of a million people viewed that with great interest. A lot of concern about what's going on in the world. But you can find the list of, of the videos that we've produced, plus this series, by going to YouTube and then typing in Discovery News. Chuck Anderson. We're so glad you are with us today. I uh, hope that the series is an encouragement to you. Uh, our next video about the churches at Pergamos and Thyatira, you won't believe the suffering. I mean, it's just unbelievable.
but the uh, words of encouragement to us uh, will continue through this series. I hope you'll join us next time. God bless you. Have a good day.